1973, the socialist Chilean government of Allende was overthrown with lightning speed. Military generals led by Augusto Pinochet rushed into the parliament and seized power, with President Allende killing himself in the process. What followed was a 16-year authoritarian dictatorship known for its brutality towards political opponents, driven by a mission of eliminating Chilean socialism. Despite the proven record of violence, General Pinochet up to this day remains a controversial figure, with many considering his reforms a necessary step in building a solid Chilean society. How did Pinochet manage to maintain his public approval while at the same time making nearly 4,000 people disappear forever? The origins of this story trace back to the year 1970, when communist-leaning Salvador Allende was publicly elected the president of Chile. Upon securing power, Allende proceeded to transform Chilean society into his utopian vision, looking at the Cuban revolution as his prime example. Allende wanted to build a socialist dream, and to that end, he was prepared to undertake any necessary measures. Allende rushed into a program of land reform, nationalization of industry, and government spending to stimulate the economy. By early 1971, landlords became reluctant to maintain properties that might be seized at any moment. Business owners began leaving the country, taking their capital with them, and the public significantly suffered shortages of essential goods. Such devastating economic reforms led to hyperinflation, and soon, the majority of the population, along with many government officials, were in favor of political change, even if it meant a military coup. A wave of protests sparked all across Chile, creating a climate of instability and tension throughout the country. For almost three years, Chile became increasingly polarized politically as the Allende government continued to blindly implement its socialist program. Political opposition in Congress had to find a solution, and in the military, they saw a needed partner to restore democratic stability in the country. Little did they know that the army had plans of their own. The coup of September 11, 1973, brought to a close the profound economic, social, political and constitutional crisis. The armed forces deposed Allende, declared a state of siege, imposed military control throughout the country, dissolved Congress, and initiated a vicious crackdown on government officials, leftist parties, and social organizations. The armed forces arrogated the supreme command of the nation. They constituted a junta composed of Pinochet, Admiral Jose Toribio Marino Castro, General Gustavo Lee Guzman, and General Cesar Mendoza Duran, the respective commanders of the Army, Navy, Air Force and National Police. General Pinochet was named president of the junta, and the junta pledged to respect the law and the constitution insofar as conditions permitted. The Chilean armed forces arrived with no recent governing experience and ruled at first with no clear definition of specific powers or procedures. The military takeover of Chile was quick and relatively bloodless. The actual bloodshed occurred after the military assumed firm control. The immediate victims of the coup and those who were rounded up in the aftermath included former members of the popular unity government, leftist party members, and peasant and union organizers. Many of these were promptly executed. Shortly after seizing power, the junta began issuing decree laws to legalize their actions. The first step, the 1974 definition of the nature of the presidency, put an end to the initial talk of an annually rotating presidency. Additionally, the new government declared an immediate state of siege. It defined it as a state or time of war, allowing the military tribunals to take over the role of civilian courts. This meant that the military could control every aspect of legal procedure against opposing individuals. It also reinstated the use of the death penalty as a form of punishment. The new government abolished the Congress by decree and conferred on itself the executive, legislative and constituent powers prescribed by the Constitution. Mass detentions, executions and disappearances followed. Raids on suspected leftist strongholds continued day after day until over 45,000 people were being held for interrogation in army barracks, training camps and soccer stadiums. By December of 1973, some 1,500 civilians had been killed either in confrontations, torture chambers, or executions by firing squads after summary sentencing by military war tribunals. Nevertheless, it is crucial to understand the internal power dynamic inside the junta itself. Unlike what many assume, Pinochet did not have complete control over other generals. 
The decree that officially made Pinochet president of Chile also took away the traditional presidential authority of appointing heads of army, navy, and air force. Thus, Pinochet did not have the executive power over the other junta members. Instead, the junta was organized as a body of joint governance, with each member holding a vote of equal value. The unanimity of all members was required to make a decision. As it turns out, Pinochet was constrained by potential and the subsequent need to attain agreement. Projects were on hold until they satisfied everyone, or else they died in the system. Above all else, the new military government blamed Chile's crisis on politics and politicians who had betrayed the nation and allowed Soviet-inspired Marxists to gain control of the Chilean state. Only by purging the politicians who had betrayed their trust, and thus eliminating the Marxist cancer, could Chile be saved from the brink of disaster. A special power-enforcing body called DINA was established to do the needed dirty work. The primary role of the DINA was the liquidation of political parties and so-called enemies of the state. Disappearances became the trademark of the DINA. Victims were seized without arrest warrants, often in broad daylight and in front of witnesses, including family members, and held incommunicado for long periods of time. Torture was practiced systemically by the DINA during interrogations. DINA mainly targeted members of three political parties, the Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria, shortly MIR, the Socialist Party, and the Communist Party. Amongst them, MIR was considered the most dangerous since its members were dedicated to opposing the regime by any means, including violence and terror. The head of DINA at the time, Manuel Sepulveda, published a photocopy of a list of dangerous targeted individuals in his book about those events. The MIR was disproportionately in the lead. After the initial years of harsh repressions, by August 1977, the DINA had worn out its welcome. It was politically hurtful for the Junta to maintain an association with a publicly hated organization such as DINA. Thus, in that year, it was dissolved, and a new, cleaner agency emerged to take its place, the National Center of Information, shortly CNI. The CNI was subordinate to the Ministry of Interior instead of being directly linked to the Junta, as was the DINA. Although its powers were identical to those exercised by the DINA, the CNI adopted a subtler method of repression and terror. Instead of abducting people in broad daylight, the CNI chose to stage elaborate shootouts with alleged leftist terrorists. The CNI was officially declared a part of the armed forces for all jurisdictional and disciplinary purposes. To cover up its actions during the period of DINA, the Junta introduced the Amnesty Law in 1978. This law effectively prohibited investigations into human rights crimes committed during the early and harshest years of the regime. The law bestowed amnesty on all persons who took part in politically motivated criminal acts while the state of siege was in effect between 1973 and 1978. This meant that even if disappearances were to be proven, the law was protecting the perpetrators from persecution. In 1981, the military government imposed upon Chile a new constitution approved the previous year in a managed plebiscite. The new constitution outlawed all groups and political parties considered to be contrary to morality, public order, and national security. Additionally, it made the legal basis for Pinochet to remain the president and head of the junta for eight more years. General Pinochet called this new political system authoritarian democracy. One of the most sensational human rights cases to emerge out of the Pinochet era is the Quemados case, which involved the burning of two college students, one of US citizenship, by security forces in 1986. The two students had been attending a protest rally when an army patrol stopped them, and according to the testimony of 12 eyewitnesses, doused them with gasoline and set them ablaze. Rodrigo Rojas, who had lived most of his life in the United States, died of his bums. The civilian judge investigating the case ignored eyewitness testimony and accepted the official version of the events based on the testimony of the accused soldiers. He released all of the accused. By mid-1982, the effects of the international recession and Chile's debt crisis pushed unemployment up to 20%, thereby producing a desperate situation for millions of Chilean workers and growing impoverishment for even middle sector and professional groups. A decline in the economy coupled with a concomitant increase in political opposition and protest, resulted in a backlash of repression. Pinochet was met with increasing demands for democratic free elections, 
and within two days after a paralyzing strike in late October 1984, he issued a state of emergency and a subsequent state of siege. As democratic opposition activity surged in 1985 and 1986 and terrorist activity increased, cases of government-instigated disappearances surfaced again. Then, in 1986, General Pinochet himself was attacked as his motorcade, returning to Santiago from the countryside, was ambushed and five of his bodyguards were killed. Surviving the assassination attempt, Pinochet only became growingly furious, which was reflected in his detaining strategy. The Carabineros estimated that they alone arrested almost 900,000 people during 1985. While the majority of these detainees were subsequently released, cases of government-instigated torture and executions were on the rise. By 1988, the eight-year deadline set by the 1980 Constitution was around the corner, and Junta was scheduled to make a decision considering Pinochet's presidency. A massive part of Chilean society was fed up with the authoritarian regime and wanted to return to democracy. Thus, a public vote was held on whether to allow Pinochet to remain in power for eight more years or not. The Chilean people said no. On October 5, 1988, voters rejected Pinochet. The junta officially lost the majority of public trust. All the parties were legally restored as the country prepared for its first free presidential and legislative elections since 1973. In the December 1989 presidential election, Christian Democrat Patricio Aylwin Azucar won by a large margin. Aylwin supported Chile's free market system, but also emphasized social and political change. Before stepping down, Pinochet was able to appoint several new Supreme Court justices and claim a lifetime senatorial seat. He also retained significant power as commander of the armed forces until his retirement from the military only in 1998. In short, the new Chilean government allowed Pinochet and other junta members to walk away. The families of the disappeared did not receive the justice they were hoping for. Despite losing power, Pinochet still maintained considerable support within Chilean society. The decision not to persecute him might have been justified in the minds of Chilean leaders by not provoking another wave of public outrage. Nevertheless, as Pinochet's health continued to decline as he grew older, he had to undergo a medical procedure in London in 1998. Chile and the world were taken by surprise when British police officers walked into a London clinic to arrest a former Chilean dictator. The decision to indict Pinochet originated more than 6,000 miles away from Chile in the chambers of Madrid's national courthouse. A Spanish judge named Baltazar Garzón demanded that the 83-year-old ex-dictator stand trial on charges of torture, terrorism and genocide. In January 2000, Pinochet won an appeal on medical grounds and was permitted to return home. Pinochet died in 2006 without ever having been tried for the human rights abuses that occurred while he was in power.